Hello, everyone. Welcome to this um, session for the Decentering Whiteness discussion series. Uh, today's topic is on white supremacy and anti-Blackness. Um, we're very fortunate, uh, the Edith Lando Virtual Learning Center, to um, partner up with um, our organizers, uh, George and Andrew, from the Vancouver School Board. Um, George and Andrew work together at the uh, Maji uh, Secondary. George is a counselor and member of the Vancouver Secondary Teachers Association. Um, Maji site structure and Andrew is the principal of the school and current chair of the Vancouver Association of Secondary School Administrators. Um, just a kind reminder that uh, UBC is on the unceded um, territory of the Masculine people. And now I am going to transfer this call to our organizers. Andrew, George, please kindly take over. Thanks so much, Calvin. Thanks a million for all your technical support and your assistance with everything. Um, welcome, you guys. Welcome, people, for, to, to our second reading group session. Uh, and Vince, welcome as our keynote uh, guest facilitator alpha as always another colleague and friend who has been involved since session one um, for your insights and and um, advice and comments um, what you're seeing now um, good people is part of and uh, one of the objectives of this this program is to share resources um, and this is a site which um, george and i came across last year and uh, for this opening for the second workshop the opening slide was a screenshot from um, this particular web page, and we'll be sending the reference out, the link out later. But George and I felt that it was useful, it would be meaningful for us to put it up there when we speak about um, so-called white supremacy and anti-blackness, because if anything summarizes uh, that position, it is what we're seeing here, which is a striking um, graphic and, a, and, a, and a, a striking database of information. So when you get it and you want to look at it, we're going to be showing this around Black History Month and the start of it on February the second, first, second, third, uh, up in our atrium in the in front of this in, in the atrium inside the school here. We've got a projector and we're going to be projecting this and just letting it run. And you can see there's different um, speeds down in the bottom left hand corner, um, and we'll just put it on 1.5 speed. And and as you let it run, you see the years change in the top left hand corner. Um, and those are all the ships which were um, conveying slaves from Africa um, to Brazil, um, Central America, and, and America. Um, and stopping it allows us to um, take, a, take a look at any of the dots, because one dot is one ship, um, and they're color-coded per nation, nationality. Uh, and here we've just randomly chosen the good ship Ligero, and we can read more about it. Um, and we can find out um, the ID that's from the database uh, and then information about it, the country where it's coming from, the destination. Uh, what I find really interesting, one of the things is the owner is sometimes identified. Um, mm -hmm. And what I've done is I've looked up some of these owners in um, Ancestry.com, and we can see who their current beneficiaries of this, uh, this, of the slave trade are or were are, um, and the, we can find out a little bit of background about Jose Gomez Gomez's ancestry, and and it's fairly easy to track down and and then go on to Google, and we can see sometimes additional information. I, I was following some of the British earls and lords who benefited from the slave trade. You can also see particular outcomes of the voyage, voyage uh, the slaves, um, if the ship was captured during the. Um, the process of ending the slave trade. And then as you scroll down, which I don't think I can do, um, let me see if I can. Oh, there we go. Um, there's some of the databases more complete for some because ship's captains kept meticulous logs uh, and many of these logs have survived in various archives. Yeah. Um, and you can see where the first place of um, disembarkment uh, and sometimes you can see... Um, Captain and crew is here at the bottom of the page. Um, here you can see the total slaves who were captured, um, who embarked, who left, 
um, and then who arrived. So this is a relatively small number um, of slaves who passed away um, on the voyage. Uh, if you look around and spend some time, you can see more um, slightly higher number of slaves, generally around about 10 to 15 percent um, of the slaves passed away um, during transit. Um, and some of the other data that I've looked at can also see this information, percent men, women, boys, girls, males, children. Uh, and so this one isn't as complete as some, but quite often you can find additional information, which um, as if this isn't shocking enough already, and as if this doesn't encourage white people like myself to question uh, that racist superiority complex, which many, many white people walk around with. Um, this database, I think, is one of those which helps to decenter that um, notion of, of white supremacy, which many of us have still, uh, implicitly or explicitly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll just let it run for a few more seconds here. Um, we're now in 1807, um, and you can see how the slave trade takes off with the development of mercantile capitalism or, or mercantilism. Um, and we'll just stop it one more time, 1811, just through the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and randomly, we've hit on another Portuguese ship, and this is Manuel de Santos's Pinto, um, the owner, and no information on slaves, 183 captured and 160 disembarked. Andrew, I'll send out the link so people can also go on this on their own if they're interested in pursuing it further, because as uh, on the top left corner, it says over 31,000 ships set sail. There you go. This, it's a huge database, some incredible information. And I, I would encourage people to perhaps, if you use it in your socials, English, uh, even statistics and math classes, there's various applications here. So um, thanks so much, George, if you post that. Just it. It's there for everybody to grab if they like. Thanks, brother. You can go back here and then hopefully. So that's just some resource sharing, but um, it uh, centers, I hope, in, in a kind of meditative way, um, what we're talking about. Um, and as if we didn't know it already, it reminds us of, of the viciousness of, of history. Part of what um, George and Alpha and I um, and Vince, thank you for joining us, are trying to do here is to get a better understanding of history and the ghosts um, and how those ghosts of history affect us and how those ghosts are still alive. Uh, and so one of our previous readings and one of our previous books in our first session, um, Leopold's Ghost, and the video that we encourage people to um, is available as well, the film version of that. There's a phenomenal, phenomenal film version um, called um, King Leopold's Ghost. Uh, that I'm not sure if people have been able to watch. And we just encourage you to watch that because it makes it very, very, the film version, I think, makes it, it does a better job of showing the effect of those ghosts. And this was a part of our conversation. I can find what that link as well. No sweat, George. It's, uh, I think uh, um, folks, I think, should be able to be able to find it. It'll okay. be pretty pretty easy. Just a quick overview, overview for today. Um if people were able to read uh, Sashi Tarur's Inglorious Empire, that's awesome. It's a relatively simple, straightforward read, about seven or eight chapters, 200-odd pages. Uh, each chapter systematically goes through a, a different claim regarding um, the benefits of colonial rule, um, and Sashi just um, deconstructs that systematically. And then the secondary reading, if people were able to or wanted to focus on that, the Black Jacobins. Um, otherwise, um, Ralph Trulio's Silencing the Past, Chapter 3. Uh, and then Vince's, I did send it out as well. If people were able to read Vince's Make Chinatown Great Again. Uh, and then Vince, we're going to talk about and chat with just now and bring him in um, around some of the conversation there. Um Linton Questy Johnson, Forces of Victory. Linton, we'll talk a little bit, uh, introduce Linton just now as well. And then if you can, um, the film The 13th is a, another excellent documentary on the 13th Amendment uh, to the U.S. Constitution that um, claims to abolish slavery, um, but reinvented it in a different way. Um, and I think that um, Vince's essay um, shows a similar kind of reinventing process that goes on. Um, right here in the local downtown east side. And so the personal is political and these 
forces intersect in different ways. Um, moving on quickly on to you know the reading that we we looked at, if if you're able to, um, and Sashi Tarur is part of a a tradition of of anti-colonial writers um, or writers who question and and raise issues around. Uh, colonial, colonial rule and and um, the white, essentially white colonial pro project. Earlier folks were Walter Rodney, some of you might have heard of, and Eduardo Galliano, Walter Rodney, really looking at Africa, a classic text from back in the day called um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And I remember hearing about that in South Africa in perhaps 1982 or something, um, and just being struck by the title because as a white South African, we'd been, that simply was not a notion that Europe underdeveloped Africa. Um, as a white South African, we are systematically told through our schooling process that no, us white folks were here to save Africa. And just when Walter Rodney's book came out and I heard about this title, um, I was dumbfounded that anyone could say such a thing. Um, and so, so, so that was that's Walter's important contribution. Eduardo Galliano, um, focusing on Central and South America, a phenomenal series of of books and activism that uh, Galliano has presented. Um, and then Sashi Teruru's book is quite recent. Um, and interestingly, of course, this is just the folks from the past 40 years or so. There is a tradition of people who have written and critiqued the colonial project over time. And even at the time, um, there's a, a literature of people who did speak to that. Um, and drawing on that um, in our first session, we had Lindqvist, um, a Scandinavian scholar, um, whose book was Exterminate All the Brutes, referring to Joseph Conrad. And Lindqvist was saying, look, we know, and we knew, and we were writing about it. And if you have time to read um, Lindqvist's Exterminate the Brutes, you'll see there's chapters in there where he speaks to folks um, who, who were aware of what was going on in, in Africa and parts of Europe um, and realized that the abomination of humanity that was going on. Um, for now, um, we're going to try um, to click onto this link um, of Sashi Tarur um, speaking at Oxford a couple of years back. Um, and Sashi was invited to speak at the Oxford Debating Club, which uh, Boris Johnson was once a chairperson of, and all of those uh, British elites um, were part of. Um, and Sashi was asked to speak on Britain and reparations and the reparations debate. Um, and it's a classic debate. It's 15 minutes long, but it's well worth watching the use of rhetoric um, and the powerful passion that um, Dr. Tarur represents uh, speaking from the perspective of India. Um, and in terms of us intending to decenter um, and, and look at the different experiences of racism, um, George and I felt that inglorious empire and so Sashi's um, contribution was important here. Um, one last piece. This debate summarizes, and it's from this debate that the book Inglorious Empire um, emerged. Um, after this, uh, and in preparation for this debate, um, Tarur was um, doing research and had a team. He was a parliamentarian, so he had some resources as well. And then um, the book Inglorious Empire takes a different points and positions further. So we've got 15 minutes if people want to um, sit back. We now finding myself the seventh speaker out of eight in what must already seem a rather long evening to you. I rather feel like Henry VIII's last wife. I more or less know what's expected of me, but I'm not sure how to do it any differently. <laughs> Perhaps what I should do is really try and pay attention to the arguments that were advanced by the opposition today. We had, for example, Sir Richard Osway suggesting, they challenging the very idea that it could be argued that the economic situation of the colonies was actually worsened by the experience of British colonialism. Well, I stand to offer you the Indian example, Sir Richard. India's share of the world economy when Britain arrived on its shores was 23%. By the time the British left, it was down to below 4%. Why? Simply because India had been governed for the benefit of Britain. In Britain's rise for 200 years was financed by its depredations in India. In fact, Britain's industrial revolution was actually premised upon the deindustrialization of India. The handloom weavers, for example, famed across the world, whose products were exported around the world, Britain came right in, 
there were actually these weavers making fine muslin, light as woven air, it was said. And Britain came right and smashed their thumbs, broke their looms, imposed tariffs and duties on their cloth and products, and started, of course, uh, taking the raw materials from India and shipping back manufactured cloth, flooding the world's markets with what became the products of the dark and satanic mills of Victorian England. That uh, meant that the weavers in India became beggars, and India went from being a world-famous exporter of finished cloth into an importer, went from having 27% of world trade to, to less than 2%. Meanwhile, colonialists like Robert Clive bought their rotten boroughs in England on the proceed to their dictionaries as well as their habits. Uh, and the British had the goal to call him Clive of India as if he belonged to the country when all he really did was to ensure that much of the country belonged to him. By the end of the 19th century, the fact is that India was already Britain's biggest cash cow, the world's biggest purchaser of British goods and exports, and the source of highly paid employment for British civil servants. We literally paid for our own oppression. And as has been pointed out, the wealthy Victorian British families that made their money out of, out of the slave economy, one fifth of, 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 the, of the elites of, of the wealthy class in Britain in the 19th century owed their money to transporting three million Africans across the waters. And in fact, in 1833, when slavery was abolished, what happened was that a compensation of 20 million pounds was paid, not as reparations to those who had lost their lives or, or who had suffered or been oppressed by slavery, but to those who had lost their property. I was struck by the fact that your Wi-Fi password of this union commemorates the name of Mr. Gladstone, the great liberal hero. Well, I'm sorry, his family was one of those who benefited from the, from the stump. Staying with India, between 15 and 29 million Indians died of starvation in British-induced famines. The most famous example, of course, was the Great Bengal Famine during the Second World War, when four million people died because Winston Churchill deliberately, as a matter of written minuted policy, proceeded to divert essential supplies from civilians in Bengal to sturdy Tommies and Europeans uh, as reserve stockpile. He said that the starvation of any way underfed Bengalis mattered much less than that of sturdy Greeks. This is Churchill's actual quote. And when conscious stricken British officials wrote to him, pointing out that people were dying because of, of this decision, he peevishly wrote in the margins of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? So all notions that the British were trying to do their colonial enterprise out of enlightened despotism to try and bring the benefits of, of colonialism and civilization to the benighted heathen. I'm sorry, Churchill's conduct in 43, simply one example of many that gave a lie to this myth. As others have said and on the proposition, violence and racism were the reality of the colonial experience. And no wonder that the sun never sat, set on the British Empire, because even God couldn't trust the English in the dark. <laughs> Let me take World War I as a, as a very concrete example, since the first speaker, Mr. Lee, suggested these things couldn't be quantified. Well, let me quantify World War I for you. Again, I'm sorry, from an Indian perspective, others have spoken of other countries. One sixth of all the British forces that fought in the war were Indian. 54,000 Indians actually lost their lives in that war. 65,000 were wounded. Another 4,000 remained missing or in prison. Indian taxpayers had to cough up 100 million pounds in that time's money. India supplied 70 million rounds of ammunition, 600,000 rifles and machine guns, 42 million garments were stitched and sent out of India, and 1.3 million Indian personnel served in this war. I know all this because, of course, the, the, the commemoration of the centenary has just taken place. But not just that. India had to supply 173,000 animals, 370 million tons of supplies. And in the end, the total value of everything that was taken out of India, India and India, by the way, suffering from recession at that time and poverty and hunger, was in today's money, it's billion pounds. You want quantification? It's available. Second World War, it was even worse, two and a half million Indians in uniform. I won't belabor the point, 
but of Britain's total war debt of three billion pounds in 1945 money, 1.25 billion was owed to India and never actually paid. Somebody mentioned Scotland. Well, fact is that colonialism actually cemented your union with Scotland. You know, the Scots had actually tried to send colonies out uh, before 1707. They'd all failed, I'm sorry to say. But then, of course, came Union, and India was available, and there you had a disproportionate employment of Scots. I'm sorry, Mr. Mackenzie has to speak after me. Engaged in this colonial enterprise as soldiers, as merchants, as agents, as employees, and the earnings from India is what brought prosperity to Scotland, even pulled pull Scotland out of poverty. Now that India is no longer there, no wonder the bonds are loosening. Now we've heard other arguments on this side. There's been a, a mention of the railways. Well, let me tell you, first of all, as my colleague, the Jamaican High Commissioner has pointed out, uh, railways and roads were really built to serve British interests and not those of the local people. But I might add that many countries have built railways and roads without having had to be colonized in order to do so. Uh, they, They were designed to carry raw materials from the hinterland into the ports to be shipped to Britain. And the fact is that the Indian or Jamaican or other colonial public, their needs were incidental. Transportation, there was no attempt made to match supply to demand for mass transport, none whatsoever. Instead, in fact, the Indian railways were built with massive incentives offered by Britain to British investors guaranteed out of Indian taxes paid by Indians, with the result that you actually had one mile of Indian railway costing twice what it cost to build the same mile in Canada or Australia because there was so much money being paid in extravagant returns. Britain made all the profits, controlled the technology, supplied all the equipment, and absolutely all these benefits came as private enterprise, British private enterprise, at public risk, Indian public risk. That was the, the, the railways as an accomplishment. We're hearing about aid. I think it was, uh, it was, it was again, Sir Richard Ottawa mentioned uh, uh, British aid to India. Well, let me just point out that British aid to India is about 0.4% of India's GDP. The government of India actually spends more on fertilizer subsidies, which might be an appropriate metaphor for that argument. If I may point out as well, that as my fellow speak, there have been incidents of racial violence, of loot, of massacres, of bloodshed, of transportation, in India's case, even of one of our, our last Mughal emperor. Yes, maybe today's Britons are not responsible for some of these depredations, but the same speakers are pointed with pride to their foreign aid. You're not responsible for the people starving in Somalia, but you give them aid. Surely the principle of reparations for what is for the wrongs that have been done cannot be denied. It's been pointed out, for example, the dehumanization of Africans in the Caribbean, the massive psychological damage that has been done, the undermining of social traditions, of property rights, of, of the authority structures of these societies, all in the interests of, of, of British colonialism. And the fact remains that many of today's problems in these countries, including the persistence, in some cases, the creation of racial and ethnic and religious tensions, were the direct result of the colonial experience. So there is a moral debt that needs to be paid. Someone challenged uh, reparations elsewhere. Well, I'm sorry, Germany doesn't just give reparations to Israel. It also gave reparations to Poland. Perhaps some of the speakers here are too young to remember the dramatic picture of Chancellor Willy Brandt on his knees in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1970. And there are other examples. There is uh, Italy's reparations to Libya. There's Japan's to Korea. Even Britain has paid reparations to the New Zealand Maoris. So it's not as if this is something unprecedented or unheard of that's going to somehow open some sort of nasty Pandora's box. No wonder Professor Lewis reminded us that he's from Texas. There's a wonderful expression in Texas that summarizes the arguments of the opposition, all hat and no cattle. Now, if I can just quickly look through the other notes I was scribbling while they were speaking. There was reference to democracy and rule of law. Let me say with the greatest possible respect, you can, it's a bit rich to oppress, enslave, kill, torture, maim people for 200 years and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. We denied democracy, sir. We had to snatch it, seize it from you. 
with the greatest of reluctance, it was conceded in India's case, after 150 years of British rule, and that too with limited franchise. Yes, indeed, ma'am. The opposition spoke about the Greek and the Ephesian democracy on which the West prided itself, and spoke of liberty and equality in that place, All right, I don't think that needs uh, needs contradiction, not for me at any rate. <laughs> but but if I if I may just if I may just point out, I think the arguments made by a couple of the speakers, the first speaker, Mr. Lee in particular, conceded all the evil atrocities of colonialism, but essentially suggested that reparations won't really help. They won't help the right people. They'll be used as a propaganda tool. They'll embolden people like Mr. Mugabe. It's always nice how in the old days, you know, uh, I'm sorry to say that. Uh, the, the people of the Caribbean used to frighten their children into behaving and sleeping by saying Sir Francis Drake would come after them. That was a legacy of that. Of that. Now, that now it's Mugabe will be there. So this is the, the new sort of Sir Francis Drake of our times. The fact is, the fact is very simply, sir, that we are not talking about reparations as a tool to empower anybody. They're a tool for you to atone for the wrongs that have been done. And I... <laughs> I am quite prepared to accept the proposition that you can't evaluate, put, a, put a, a monetary sum on the kinds of horrors people have suffered. Certainly no amount of money can expiate the loss of a loved one, as, as somebody pointed out there. Uh, you're not going to be able to figure out an exact amount. But the principle is what matters. The fact is that to speak blithely of sacrifices on both sides, uh, as an analogy was used here, a burglar comes into your house ransacks the place, stubs his toe, and you say, well, he, there was a sacrifice on both sides. That, I'm sorry to say, is not an acceptable, is not an acceptable argument. Um, the truth is that um, we are not arguing specifically that vast sums of money need to be paid. The proposition before this house is the principle of owing reparations, not the fine points of how much is owed to whom it should be paid, question is, is there a debt? Does Britain owe reparations? As far as I'm concerned, the ability to acknowledge a wrong that has been done, to simply say sorry, will go a far, far, far longer way than some percentage of GDP in, 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 form, in the form of, of, of aid. What is required, it seems to me, is accepting the principle that reparations are owed. Personally, I'd be quite happy if it was one pound a year for the next 200 years after the last 200 years of Britain and India. Thank you very much, Madam President. So um, <clears throat> that's a summary of, of uh, Sasha's book, um, but raises a whole bunch of really, I think, important points and, and, uh, and vital questions. One of them, of course, came from the debate that he was part participating in on the question of reparations, um, and how can how how does Britain owe reparations to the colonized? And here, I think here in Vancouver and British Columbia, um, when we're talking about reconciliation uh, within the indigenous community, there are sectors and members of of that community which um, speak to the whole aspect of reparations and the reparations debate. And in our third session coming up with Glenn Coltard. Um, I think this is an important question which we, sh we could um, raise with Glenn around his position, his notion of reparations uh, and reconciliation. And then another part to that was, would be, of course, resurgence. Um, I think the important point with that um, Dr. Tarur made was reparations is for us to atone and uh, for if that is at all possible for um, people of color, of well, white people to atone in any way for what has happened in our past and what we are responsible for. Um, and Sasha suggests it's not possible. And that's why a $1 a year is probably about as much as, as we can expect from, um, from colonizers, former colonizers. I think another really another piece which um, popped into my mind when you were speaking about India's contribution to the to World War One, um, and in South Africa, South Africa was part of uh, the Union of South Africa. Of course, was part of what was then the Commonwealth. Um, and though we had a white minority government at the time that had been installed by the British, 
um, when the start of World War, when World War One started, um, there was a meeting between the finance minister of South Africa and the British Chancellor of, of, the, of the Exchequer, and was agreed for all gold production, um, all South African gold production, to go straight to um, fund the British war effort. It was all gold production in South Africa was owned by Great Britain for the duration of the war. Um, and in that agreement, uh, there was a, the, the clause that it was repayable with interest um, on demand by the South African government. Um, and that debt was never repaid. And then when we had the sanctions debate being raised, uh, there was a meeting between the South African foreign minister and Margaret Thatcher in 1979. Um, and the South African um at that minuted meeting uh, requested the repayment of the World War One debt, the gold debt that Britain owes to South Africa, uh, and said, and part of that meeting was if um, Margaret Thatcher finds it in her soul to support uh, sanctions, then we would be requesting that money back from um, Britain. If Margaret Thatcher would argue against sanctions and support the South African racist state, then uh, they wouldn't be requesting the money back. So we all know where uh, Margaret Thatcher went. She followed the money, uh, as well as probably her own political principles, and she opposed sanctions. So that debt is still paid. And, and similarly, um, the debt in India, which Dr. Tarur was referring to. I just wanted to add that little personal piece coming from South Africa. The last part I think that was interesting was um, governing for the benefit of India um, and industrialization in England was premised on the deindustrialization of India. Uh, and that is another piece which um, came up in uh, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, Walter Rodney's um, and Galliano's open veins of a continent focusing on South America. Uh, and similarly, I think we could um, look at examples of French colonial rule in Southeast Asia um, and Vietnam and Cambodia. And uh, uh, the, the, the links are, uh, and the role of colonization and deindustrialization and the destruction of indigenous societies is a long and an old one. And that history is why we um, are having this session. And that history is also why we um, look at the downtown east side and look at our own links um, to the deindustrialization and, and the destruction of societies and how it continues to this day. Um, and that's, I think Vince will be able to speak to that far more eloquently in a few minutes just now. Just coming, uh, one or two quotes, which I wanted to pop up um, for us to look at and, and think about. Um, Lind Lindquist's from our session one um, and Sasha Turur on page 40 is at 43. Um, this is a point that uh, Dr. Turur made in, in the video. Underlying the British imperial expansion in India was a con conjuries of motivations and assumptions. Crash, commercial cupidity, need to consolidate political power to safeguard profits. Um, and this um, Dr. Teru didn't bring up very much in the speech, but is developed in the book. Also, the racist European notion express, expressed most bluntly in the Iberian conquest of the New World, that so-called heathen Indian nations were unworthy, had the unworthy status of sovereign, le sovereign legal entities. In the Americas, hostility to European traders and to the Christian gospel considered adequate causes for just war, uh, justifying terrorist con conquest and enslavement of the losers. While such a proposition was not explicitly stated in India, the British broadly shared the same set of beliefs as the European um, confraries in the West. Uh, and this is a very striking piece that echoes um, the conversation that we had in session one with Landquist, who points out that we knew, um, and it was clear and it was apparent what was going on in different parts of the world. And these were explicit statements of policy. Uh, and statements of biologic uh, eugenics um, and the, just, the scientific justification um, for racism was a deep and fundamental and endearing part of, Europeans, uh, of European scholarship. Um, so I would push and, and challenge Tarur a bit further on this, that I think he's understating um, the, the, the nature of uh, scientific racism uh, and that he's, I think he's not stating it clearly enough how much England and British racism was based in that fascist notion of superiority um, and white supremacy. 
Um, so that would be my reaction, my thoughts to Dr. Tarur um, uh, and this particular piece and quote here. You know, the causes of a just war. Um, he's also, of course, referring to um, Hitler's justification um, for the Nazi genocide uh, and the notions, the, the thesis of a just war, which is a part of um, the European military strategy um, in conventional warfare. But I'm wanting us to stay a little bit with the Lindqvist on that we knew about what was going on. Uh, and we can't say that, oh, we didn't know, and that this is really new to us. Um, any thoughts there, Alpha or Vince or, or anyone, any of the colleagues, any of our participants, any thoughts there? Any Anything to add? Um, um, going back to your statement of the understatement of the scientific uh, impact on on uh, um, slavery, I think there was a big impact there, and uh, the Darwinistic movement actually played. A, I believe that it played a major role. I think that they knew what was going on, but they had the opportunity to change it. I think that sometimes um, they used the Christian, as I said, the Christian gospel as a uh, as a as a cover for the work, and, uh, and they added that into them going into the war. But I I think by reading Linkfist, I also saw that um, they had an option to change. And but I think the you know the uh, theory that Darwin had in a very big way played a role in in, in terms of eradicating and trying to get rid of um, the brutes because the survival of the fist, mm -hmm. fittest kind of played a role and they were just playing their role in getting rid of the scum of the earth so that they can, you know, the empire may, may take over. And it was their duty kind of to do that. And uh, so I think that's important. And uh, it, it's also, you know, not just that, but also watching the video, I, I was pretty powerful to see when you hear that, the, the value um, of the return on that investment of colonization, how much they were getting back in return for the lives that were lost, you know, and and using the, you know, the people of India to actually pay for the cost of colonization. And uh, while Scotland and the rest of the world was benefiting, that's a, you know, so it's just like, we came, we took over and you paid for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> paid for the wall, so to speak. Yep. You, know, you know what I mean? And, uh, and uh, wow, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I stop right And that's there very the, the, yeah. The, the chapter in in in, um, in Glorious Empire where he speaks and he shows the extent of um, the people of India paying for uh, the colonial state. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just it's unbelievable when you, when you read the details that he provides there. Yeah. Um, Vince, do you have any thoughts at this point? Do you want to chip in? Uh, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I listened to the audiobook uh, of Shashtar, mm -hmm. um, Glorious Empire. It's, it's great. It's good. Guy has, he narrates it himself. He has a great voice. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like the kind of structuring of his argument, you know, um, that he kind of front loads it with the looting of India, right? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's really powerful, obviously, to kind of have that like balance sheet of just like, you know, literally trillions of pounds all the ways in which, um, you know, the land and the people uh, were systematically destroyed and exploited um, for, you know, essentially profit, right? And I think that that's, uh, for me, you know, thinking through questions of like white supremacy or racism, um, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, let's say like a, an accolade of the camp um, that would say that like, yeah, there's an, an economic basis, right? Um, that fundamentally is like that engine uh, that creates, you know, racism as as a technique, right, or as a kind of ideology um, that you know continues to propel it like a vicious cycle. Uh, but ultimately, you know, I think Shashi Toro also makes the makes the point later on in the book is that like no one would do this stuff. Like you know, essentially, uh, <laughs> yeah, creation of slavery wasn't to create racism, right? It's the other way around, right? Racism was you know an ideology produced through you know scientific philosophical theories of, about like you know biological uh, uh traits uh but in order to actually continue to justify and expand 
uh, essentially a, a you know form of uh, exploitation, right? Mm-hmm. Form of dominating people, herding them into property, um, and and exploiting them for money, right? Um, and I think that that's for me a helpful way because uh, to think about race and racism, because oftentimes you know race itself, as as my kind of essay mm-hmm. um, gets into, is is like an unstable kind of signifier, let's say, mm-hmm. um, and changes throughout history, depending on, you know, whatever the regime of, let's say, accumulation of, uh, um, you know, is dominant at that mode, uh, or at that time in history. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, it was a good book, very straightforward. <laughs> um, and, and like, yeah, very kind of just like, fact, 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 um, mm-hmm. and, you know, explained very really eloquently. So mm-hmm. good mm-hmm. book. I'm glad that uh, you find it. Thanks so much, Vince. Um, just a, a, a quote which I've got written down on the side here um, was, which also refers back to the notion of the ghosts of colonization um, that Sashi mentions on page 216. Um, by the end of uh, imperial rule in, in India, um, India was one of the poorest, most backward, illiterate, and diseased societies on earth by the time of our independence in 1947. And that was a country which, in 1750, um, together with China, accounted for 75% of world industrial output. So in 1750, India and China, 75% of world industrial output, and then in comes 200 years of colonial rule, and we've got turned into, as Sasha says, the poorest, most backward, illiterate, and diseased societies on earth. He gives some information about that, and then he points out India had been reduced to a poor third world country, destitute and starving, a global poster child of poverty and famine. Freedom from Britain turned those numbers around for India. Um, And it was from that that India was then able to start redeveloping. And similarly, China, um, after the destruction of English rule in southern China, um, was able to start over time developing. Um, So those are the ghosts of of colonization, which we spoke extensively about in our last session but which we are dealing with still today here in Vancouver um, and in our communities uh, and which we as, as people on, on a, all of us have the responsibility, I think, to learn and unlearn, which is what we say often, you know, we are learning and unlearning on the, the Musqueam territory. And part of what we're trying to do here is we have to confront what we've done uh, to unlearn it. Um, and this is where I think, Vince, your paper, uh, Make Chinatown Great Again, is so important and so interesting. Because uh, from your experience as a, as a um, member of that com- community, uh, and for people who don't know Vince, Vince is an um, activist and, and works in Vandu, the network of drug users downtown. Uh, and he was also active in some of the um, housing campaigns downtown. Um, and um, a union activist uh, and a community builder, a community activist. And so, Vince, thank you so much for joining us because your insights and your experience are invaluable for us to help us understand um, what can be done and sometimes what is to be done. And uh, the very last pages of your paper um, really speaks to what is to be done. Um, I thought it was on page 12, quite beautiful, where you mention. Um, how difficult it is regarding um, um, building uh, collaborations of different interests and different user groups uh, and different interest groups. Some readers may think this kind of solidarity across a measurable difference is surely impossible. They are wrong. Um, and absolutely right. It's difficult to build solidarity across um, different um, differences, immeasurable differences, but we have to do that. Because if we don't, um, the same forces that divide us are going to keep walking all over us. Um, that was one observation which I had coming from your paper. Do you do you have a few? Would you like to chat and tell us a little bit about your work uh, and the nature of, of racism and how it manifests itself in your community um, and how members of the community are, are played against each other and to for not only racist ends, um, Welcome, Vince. Hello. Uh, no, thank you for that uh, introduction. And I, I love to meet you guys. <laughs> I wish I could be in person. So I could actually, I, I would love to learn more from you guys as practicing educators. Um, but another time, we'll probably get a beer sometime in the future. Um, but so, yeah, thank you for having me. 
Um, and yeah, as Angie was saying, I've been a long time organizer in the city. I, I moved here from Montreal, um, maybe about seven, almost eight years ago now. Um, and yeah, from the very beginning, I, I got involved uh, in doing work in Chinatown. Um, my, my first kind of non-minimum wage job in the city was in Chinatown as a librarian and as an educator. Um, and But I got involved in um, some of the work Specifically around, you may see it in the news actually recently, 105 Kiefer, which was um, a condo. It was a site for a condo that was going to be built in the center of China, Chinatown. Um, and it was it was actually quite a long fight because the community had started to organize, mobilize and then organize around pushing back against having this developer like just plop this condo uh, in the you know, middle of the neighborhood that's like in desperate need of housing right, for, for the working and poor people in it, right? Um, so I started organizing with a few different groups. Chinatown Action Group was one. There's another called Chinatown Concern Group. Um, and some of this is documented in my, yeah, this short essay that I wrote uh, called Make Chinatown Great Again. Um, and it's kind of, yeah, if anyone's read it, um, it's it's kind of all, all over the place <laughs> essay, let's say a little eclectically written. Um, it jumps around between my own experience as an organizer um, in that campaign to, to fight this kind of, well, generally, not just this condo, but the idea of gentrification of Chinatown. Um, but also the kind of echoes after, um, you know, this, you know, this big campaign that like kind of took hold of the city for a couple of years, um, you know, the kind of afterlife of that campaign and then jumping back, way back in time uh, to the origins of Chinatown um, and the making of, you know, contemporary, or what would now be, but the beginnings of uh, Canadian drug policy. Um, and as, as Andrew said, I work at a place called the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. Um, it's a long time kind of drug user organizing space in downtown east side. It's been around for about 25 years. I've worked there for the last two years as an organizer. Um, and yeah, so it kind of, uh, it's, uh, how do I even start? I, I could, should I give it like a short, really short summary of it, Andrew, you think? Um, um yeah i think i think a, a brief summary there was there was a beautiful comment on page eight where um you you mention um if i can just read this piece the urgency of active acting collectively in the present demands mm -hmm. us to relinquish our individual affections to an always ephemeral past uh, this is not a div disavowal of what precedes us to wield history as a weapon we must unchain ourselves from it we must organize to be sure, but to avoid the snares of yesterday, we must challenge ourselves to question the fierce attachments that compel us to be, and to be ruthless in our critique of the ideas and desires that are said to motivate any claim over a neighborhood that we love and struggle for. Um, and I just thought that was a beautiful piece there because I know that implicitly George and I, and I know Alpha, in our conversations in, in the certainly the last session, I think that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to... Um, be able to um, wield history as a weapon in the anti-racist struggle because, and I think it's important for white folks to be involved in that. Uh, and as you know, we you know, two white men going along and, and, and being involved in this, we have to. And I think you're summarizing it there that um, it's not a disavowal of what precedes us, um, but uh, we have to unchain ourselves from it. And um, and then that organizing process is difficult and it's messy uh, and it takes different sites of struggle. And that can include what we do in VASA. It can include George and I working together on this project and bringing in Alpha. And Vince, it includes the and in your own terrain of struggle, which is the downtown east side. And do you have any comments there? Yeah, maybe I can um, just be focusing on one point, which is... Uh -huh. um, you know the the uses and abuses of like race and identity um in in like let's say contemporary chinatown politics in vancouver right yeah. um and so you know yeah like it's interesting to read uh well to actually to, to watch uh shashi Taro's, um debate because uh can like canadian chinese canadians actually had their own kind of like redress reparations movement actually focused in vancouver not too long ago around the uh essentially redress and reparations for the canadian head tax um that was you know in inflicted upon uh early 
Asian migrants, specifically Chinese migrants, coming to Vancouver. Um, essentially, it was like a flat tax, just like, you know, scooped up by the state for people who are coming here to like work, right, mm-hmm. and be exploited. There's an additional tax levied on uh, individuals that in this, you know, starting in the 70s, 80s, and then into the 90s, there was a movement uh, based in Vancouver of Chinese Canadians looking for redress and, and reparations. Um, but yeah, so, you know, there's, the, talking about race in Chinatown is is um, is very complex, and as I said earlier, like race is uh, and racism are forms of mystification uh, of like real material relations of domination and like um, and exploitation. I think, and it can work in many confusing ways, especially in our contemporary moment. Uh, and so, for instance, I'm just going to get straight to the point: is mm-hmm. that oftentimes, I'm sure you've seen in the news if you live in Vancouver. All this talk about like, you know, Chinatown is dying. Uh, Chinatown is under attack. Uh, Chinatown, you know, it's it, it's it, it's being infringed upon uh, by the downtown east side and drug users and homeless people, so on and so forth, right? Um, and but like, I, one thing that I would caution you, right, uh, is to try to see who is who is speaking uh, when it comes to these news news articles that are like you know pumped out regularly. Uh, and you you don't see even though people are talking about the residents of, of Chinatown who are often coded as like you know linguistically let's say marginalized seniors and working and poor people uh, really the, the the spokespeople of Chinatown are of a different class let's say it's often you know the heads of industry heads of real estate people who run nonprofits run benevolent societies these kind of centers of power in Chinatown speaking for and on behalf of this kind of wider Asian community. Uh, that they seem to have, you know, some unique, uh, you know, just, let's say, uh, <laughs> like mandate to represent and, and we should like mm-hmm. accept them as such, right? This, uh, you know, even though someone like, let's say, Carol Lee, who is, uh, you know, involved, like comments on Chinatown issues specifically around, you know, it's dangerous Chinatown, the failure of Chinatown, so on and so forth. She is the daughter of one of the biggest real estate magnates um, that has ever lived in Vancouver um, and has inherited his real estate regime, um, which owns a lot of property in Chinatown, right? And so, you know, in my in my view, I'm an organizer in downtown East Side, you know, as someone who, you know, is has a mandate and and is responsible and committed to, you know, serving the working class and poor folks in the neighborhood, uh, but also someone who is of Chinese origin and who has also worked in, in Chinatown, I can, you know, when I see all these news reports about Chinatown is under attack from the downtown east side. One is heartbreaking, which I think I convey in, in this uh, essay. Uh, but also it's it's a real mystification and it's an abuse of, of race uh, as this kind of category um, that like, shifts into, you know, being able to cl- make claims over like large populations of people that may not have anything to do with each other. Right. Um, and so, you know, a lot of my essay is trying to break down like the, the ways in which Chinese Canadian identity, specifically in Vancouver, has shifted quite a bit uh, from the, its early kind of conceptions in the making of Chinatown as essentially a, a, a space of exclusion and containment mm-hmm. of an unwanted population into, yeah. let's say, 100 years later, where that Chinese community that may have you know, been a little bit more homogenous at the, you know, at the first kind of uh, moments of emigration has now kind of split up into like, you know, there's poor Chinese folks and there's Chinese folks that like make a lot of money off of the backs of other people collecting rents, right? Uh, you know, patrolling streets as, as police officers, as, you know, bosses and exploiters. Um, but oftentimes we, we only hear about the interests of that upper class of, you know, let's say I would call the Chinatown elite. Um, that makes these statements about the danger of, of, you know, having drug users around. But what is this actually about? It's about their financial interest in redeveloping the neighborhood into essentially a tourist trap um, and, you know, like a place to, to you know, sell condos, essentially, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so behind a lot of this, you know, rhetoric around the dangerousness of Chinatown is really just like pure class interest uh, of drumming up fear and hatred and division in Chinatown and downtown east side, you know, to get more cops on the block, to push people off of property, essentially expel homeless people and unwanted populations, primarily indigenous, uh, out of the neighborhood. And again, essentially create more division and tension, uh, really just for the benefit of, you know, yeah, landlord profit, real estate profit, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's, I I guess that's kind of a summary of, of what I talk about in this essay. 
Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, it's for me as someone, again, as like a drug user myself, as someone who works as an organizer uh, in like a down, in, the, in the downtown east side on behalf of unhoused people, homeless folks, um, and having to face essentially all of these like, you know, elite Chinatown people saying that the people that I you know, serve are like the enemy. Um, yeah, again, it's 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 heartbreaking, and it also shows the ways in which uh, sometimes these kind of like you know politics of of um, of race and representation and of identity are actually weaponized uh, in order to sow division. Um, mm -hmm. Because actually, if you talk to any of the seniors themselves, is that of course there's conflict and tension in a neighborhood where people are essentially abandoned by yeah. the, by the government. Yeah. Um, yeah. even there's a line in, in, in the, in my essay where, uh, unfortunately a lot of like, yeah, the, the violence, uh, you know, that's, that's imposed on, on people in the neighborhood from this kind of abandonment is expressed laterally, yeah. uh, in the bread line. Right. And that's literally a, 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 the truth, right? Like, you know, these bread lines in the downtown East side are frequented by both Chinese seniors and a kind of like, like, you know, a melange of people from the downtown East side. And sometimes there are conflicts, people push each other a bit, you know, they're shoving and stuff. Um, but ultimately that comes from a, a, you know, tension built from deprivation. Um, but actually there's a shared life world between these two neighborhoods, which I would say are actually the same neighborhood, um, and forms of like everyday solidarity and like, you know, the, you know, community that is not seen when we only hear from, let's say, yeah, people who own businesses and real estate, have real estate interests in Chinatown talking about, no, these are incompatible communities we must police these borders. And there's a great deep irony historically because that's exactly how Chinatown was made in the first place. It is a product of, of exclusion and division and, and containment by police action. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, it's deeply ironic that this is coming back, you know, a hundred years later used by the same, these Chinese elites that harken back to that history, right? Again, they, they, they dredge up that history to defend themselves from what is exactly what um, the, you know, essentially the settler state was doing to Chinese people a hundred years ago, right? And so, you know, I, I think that thinking about these ghosts um, and echoes from our history actually helped to explain some of the kind of confusion um, and, and you know, it, it, the conflict of today, uh, which doesn't actually map to reality. And, and um, you know, it, it's, it's based on ideas of people's um, identity and fantasy and desire of belonging, which always, you know, and this is again, a thing I say in the essay, you know, belonging and talking about, you know, a neighborhood uh, in terms of belonging, unfortunately, you also, when you create those boundaries of who belongs, you also say who does not belong, right? Mm -hmm. um, in this neighborhood. And so when I, when I talk about at the end of the essay um, about forms of solidarity, which are real and very difficult to build, um, those are those create new forms of co community that I I think are actually far more genuine um, than you know I I don't know if Chinatown is my community I'm a Chinese guy I've worked in Chinatown I did organizing in Chinatown but am I part of that community if it can be claimed by the rich as well like rich Chinese entrepreneurs and landowners I don't know if I have community with them but I do have community with you know the poor and working people that struggle together for social housing for everyone, right? In the 58 West Hastings campaign that I also detail in this essay. Um, and I think that, that that for me is is what is beautiful about community building through movements is because it actually, you're not automatically part of a community just because you were born a certain way, right? Or you speak a certain language, or you look a certain way, but because you choose to through struggle through risk and through like fighting for something that you all care about together like that's what forms i think true community uh and these are eclectic you know wild combinations of people but in the end like i think that that is actually far more um true and powerful than you know use all these kind of mystifications of like who is the chinese community what's the chinatown community because again i have no friends uh, that are you know chinese elites i would not call those my my countrymen or my brethren uh, because they are my class enemy, <laughs> right? Um, so in the end, I, I think that, um, you know, race uh, as, uh, like is a form of mystification, um, but one that is historically rooted, um, that must be analyzed in the context of, of how race is mobilized by different forms of power, 
um, to achieve like really material ends, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I don't know, maybe I've been talking too long, but that is mm -hmm. generally what I talk about in this essay. And I, I thank you for everyone who, who took the time to read it. Um, yeah. No, for sure it needs like a couple of readings because on every reading there's new subtleties that to what we find and see. But, uh, you know, this comes to, to Georgia and I um, as the organizers here. And we, we wonder, like, decentering whiteness, well, decentering whiteness to what? And so we're wanting to decenter from a hegemonic white stream, male, white stream um, discussion, debate, identity, positionality to what? So then do we just have to uncritically jump onto another identity or do we accept, do we understand, do we unlearn our own racism and history? Um, but then, as you point out um, in the paper and what I, one of the things I hear you, you speaking to is we're decentering to what? And in a community like Chinatown, um, where we are decentering to a position which represents an elite form of acquisition of money and which many people in the community are being squeezed out of and away. And so we are then identifying with a struggle which is not which is imposed on the community, um, and what we might want to try to decenter to to use your words is wild combinations of people, right through organizing and through activism, and that phrase that you use the wild combinations of people is where I think we are needing to decenter ourselves towards, and where we accept each other's um, appearance as white, pink, people of color, et cetera, et cetera. But we are looking for those wild combinations through specific campaigns of action um, that we hope to go along and, and um, bring relief and justice to people. The last point is the breadline conflict um, is based, becomes focused on race, lateral violence, rather than deprivation and class violence. Um, and when we see it all the time, you know, and in South Africa, we see it all the time, the xenophobic race violence, where people then lash out at migrants and new migrants. Um, but uh, that is not the enemy. And so, that, you know, how to develop that form of consciousness, which is goes beyond race, decentering whiteness and decentering race, race and racial identities to a deeper understanding, which might actually help us address um, some of the structural issues which generate and use and manipulate race against each other. Um, so, yeah. Um, one other point that I wanted to look at on, on page 10, you, I put a little star next to this. Um, predictably, the quote-unquote Chinese continue to be Vancouver's go-to scapegoat for the city's interminable real estate crises. Um, and, and another form, another way in which we can uh, construct race um, and present it, and then it makes sense. It might be, it becomes commonsensical, uh, and then we might just oppose that with Huawei and other aspects of, of constructions of race um, and bring up um, these, the Asian bogeyman, which we've seen before, right? And we've played with it before to the benefit of um, racial power and, and, and capitalist power. Um, so it, it, you, I think one of the things we want to be careful of is when we're decentering whiteness, what are we decentering it to? Um, and make sure we want to decenter it towards a better analysis of what's going down and how people are being played. And this is where I'm concerned sometimes about identity politics, is that we fall into these um, and we focus only on the identities that divide us. Um, and very seldom do we then move on anymore to the an understanding and, and exploration of the identities that bring us together, which I would suggest is a class analysis. Um, any thoughts there, Alpha? You've got a frown. You're thinking lots of thoughts, no, brother. Yes, because a lot, there's a lot of great you know, meat and potatoes in, in what he said. I think it's very, first of all, one of the things, Vince, is that you talked about it is actually thank you for, for speaking today, because what you're talking about is very important. Um, one of the things that draws me to the centering of whiteness, what, what is happening here with uh, Andrew and George, is the fact that they are 
going down to the nitty gritties, if you to speak, and they're asking the individuals. Basically, what you're talking about is is uh, is key to this to this conversation that is happening here. They're not just speaking to the you know to the high end person, but they're literally. That's what what you're really talking about. Is what I love is that they're saying, "How are you thinking about?" you know, what's happening in your community. And uh, it's been fantastic when they, it's, you know, to hear who they're going to invite to be able to be part of this conversation, because what you're saying is exactly what they're doing. Many times we don't read when we're watching the news, we don't see. Many times when we read, we don't read. We don't know who the writer is. We don't know who, um, you know, the program, who's backing the advertisement or who's backing the conversation. And, mm. and it's so crucial because they can even, what you brought light to, they can even use your own people, people that, you know, and, and here, let me use another term. Even the people that are your own people, are they your own people? Do you understand what I'm saying? Because now that's where you, you choose and say, man, this, this is the money talking. They may look like me, they may talk like me, but it's not mm. me. You know, th that's the money. They want to revitalize the community, quote, quote, unquote, revitalize. OK, and well, revitalism is not the building. Revitalism is looking at the people and seeing how you can walk with them in the long run. Right. And um, just to jump back, I was looking at, um, you know, at a paper that was written not too far back about we're talking about slavery. And we were saying they were talking about specific tribes you know, in Nigeria that was selling people as slaves. And then I said, who was actually doing, who wrote that paper, right? And even though it was a person of the same community, it wasn't the same community speaking. Do you understand what I mean? So it's, it's very crucial that we spend the time to find out who's actually talking. And the best way for us to be able to find out is not just to read the news. I think we must go down and meet with the people. We need, we need to sit with the people in the places where the people that live down there, work down there, and, and have been down there, have grown up down there, you know, are able to, what they've felt and what they see, you know, because there is a life down there. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to water the plant that's already growing there, as opposed to bringing in your own plant. Right. And I, I think it's it's very crucial. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that. And and I like the the, the different um, groups that you've talked about that are, quote unquote, part of the community, but they're not. Right. It's it's it, it's just that's who it, we look for a specialist when we're looking for a specialist to revitalize, you know, you know, Chinatown. And we look for, we look for a specialist. And that, that is the person that has you know, the most money or the person that, you know, that went to school somewhere and the, but it's not the person that's living down there. It's very crucial that, and we must look to say, how can we be allies to the people that are living down there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can we be partners in the work that they would love to see? And how can we eat together? Because, you know, I like what you said, you know, the same, the same way that Chinatown was built is literally the same way that it potentially is being rebuilt again. You know, the mm -hmm. same officers that were sectioning off people in order to avoid them because of the war that was going on. It's funny that it's December. You know, that's one of the reasons why that they were because of the world war, they were putting people in camps and they were sending them off and they were saying, hey, you, you guys can only do business here. And that was, was just, per, was it Pearl Harbor, December, some, some, sometime during this right now, right? It's, it's funny that the timing is somewhat, you know, crazy, but they were, they were sectioning off people because of this very issue. And now we're redoing it again. It's the same people that they're sending in. Good understanding says, let's talk to the people. And I think that's very crucial. Uh, you know, keep on moving, keep on talking. Um, speak, <laughs> speaking about um, talking to people, uh, and we're also wanting some you know, practical unlearning that we're trying to do here as teachers and as educators, which is what uh, George and I are trying to do and what we're trying to model in our school. Um, we're turning quickly to Trulio, um, his 1995 classic book, Silencing the Past. Um, there are a couple of quotes that capture and summarize it. I just want to point out one of them. 
Um, so Trudio is, is saying in that chapter, he's fleshed out, he's summarizing, he fleshed out two points. First, the chain of events that constitute, and we're just now turning to the Haitian Revolution um, of the 17, late 17, early 1800s. Um, and uh, he, he shows how the Haitian Re Revolution is one of those unrecorded, unremarked on revolutions uh, in the world history books. And he shows this in, in his article and all the rest of that. Um, I fleshed out two major points. First, the chain of events that constitute the ha Haitian Revolution was unthinkable before those events happened. So to the European mind and the, the, the colonizers' mind, it was simply impossible that black people would want freedom. And so that there would be a revolution and black people and slaves would turn against their slave masters was unthinkable. And there are quotes from that and, and there's comments around that and he shows that he's summarizing his argument. And I think that's, that's a key argument that the language and the racism of our minds made it unthinkable that black people had an identity and had a soul and had a, had a life force of their own, which they then turned around and took up against the, the colonizers. The second, as they happen, um, the successive events within that chain were systematically recast by many participants and observers to fit a world of possibilities that they had manufactured in their own minds and their own narratives. And we do this again all the time. When we are events that are unthinkable to us, we recast those and narrate them in our minds to fit our own stereotypes and pre prejudices. And I think it's important for me in this Trulio um, extract and, and that chapter reminded me of, of, and I was forced to ask, what stories do I read and listen to? And how do I cast them into patterns and narratives that make sense to me, which might need to be challenged and shaken up? Uh, in a manner that um, Europeans were forced to, to be shaken up through the Haitian Revolution. Um, uh, that is, they were made to enter into narratives that made sense to a majority of Western observers and readers. Uh, Trulia says, I will now show, and the rest of this section, is he shows how that revolution was thought impossible by its contemporaries and was then silenced by historians. Amazing in the story is the extent to which historians have treated the events of Saint-Domique in ways quite similar to the reactions of its Western contemporaries. That is, the narratives they build around these facts are strikingly similar to narratives produced by individuals who thought that the revolution was possible, was impossible. So nothing changes because we keep on reinventing and interpreting uh, narratives within uh, the patterns of our minds. I want to jump from there to climate change, um, for example that we are now being presented by a narrative which we simply cannot understand. So we make sense of it based on old patterns. And if we keep doing that, we will never solve that issue. Um, so I think he has another way that we have to look for similarities that Vince was speaking about, what Alpha was just referring to, that cut across the normal ways of thinking and language that structures how we're thinking, to another Haitian revolution that's occurring right now. And we're not able to see it, we're not able to feel it, we're not able to understand it, because we don't understand the significance of what's happening in this other major revolution that's happening around us. The technological revolution, I think, is another one um, that we just get sidetracked by Elon Musk's ca um, cavorting around. But the significance of that revolution and what's going on um, is another Haitian revolution. And, and the, the importance of that and interpretation of that, I think, is important for us to, to think through um, the Haitian Revolution as a case study and an example. Um, I'm worrying about our time that is quickly draining away like an hourglass. Um, the Black Jacobins um, of CLR James. I uh, know, Vince, you've read it. Uh, Alpha, I'm not sure if you've read it. Um, Georgie, I'm not sure if I've even given you a copy. Um, but if some of, of the colleagues who are out there now um, are looking for a great book to read over the uh, winter break, um, that's a fantastic read, a classic text, and it really speaks to the um, Haitian Revolution, um, but it also speaks to decentering whiteness. Um, and I think we've sort of been hinting at a few opportunities in, um, to decenter whiteness. Um, a few quotes which um, we want to bring up right now from our very first session 18 months ago or so, 10 months ago, um, when we were reading Akilam Bembi, a Senegalese scholar, 
um, the, the phrase, one of the phrases that uh, Achille used, decolonization is likened to a force of radical refusal and it stands directly opposed to the passion for habituation. Um, and much of um, so much of our modern European thinking revolves around a passion for habituation. I mean, we need that. We need structure to a certain degree. Uh, in our school systems, we need timetables. We need that structure, a passion for habituation. But we have to be available and, and alert to the possibility of some form of radical refusal for that and to try to think uh, inventively around the structures that we, we work within. And that's where we bring Alpha in to work at McGee and, and we benefit so much from that partnership uh, and the radical kind of partnership which we're trying to generate within the school around uh, members of the community through our um, semester turnaround experience, right? Uh, another, I think, piece which has an echo to um, Vince, what you said just now around the wildness. Um, radical decolonization is a festival of the imagination. And, and that, if we jump back to Trulio's quote just now, um, we have to have that festival of the imagination for creative thinking, because otherwise we are just keeping on interpreting structures in the past and within frameworks of the past. Uh, the celebration of the imagination produced by struggle. Um, so in, in Vince's paper on page 12, we speak about solidarity across the immeasurable difference. That is a celebration of the Im imagination, um, because that's what we have to draw on. Um, to break those chains um, and break those old fossilized ways of thinking of racial difference as a, as a system that alienates us and cuts us off from each other. Um, Vince, Alpha, George, you got any thoughts or in fact, any of our colleagues who are out there who are still with us, um, we still have the energy. I'm not sure I haven't looked all the way down. If anyone else, anyone got any thoughts, any comments at this point? Maybe I just want to maybe um, add on and amend something that you, you had brought up earlier uh, in relation to just like comments on, on my, my paper, which I really also appreciate. So thank you so much. Um, is that I, I am also no vulgar, uh, you know, economist, right? Yeah, uh, because <laughs> I don't think that the class struggle is, is the kind of only vector of, of let, let's say the, the of history. Uh, but I do think that it provides like a material basis for understanding a lot of like, let's say, uh, yeah, the mystifications of race and racism. Uh, but I do think ultimately, you know, these things interact, let's say, dialectically. Um, and that um, when I when I do talk about like the movements that I've been a part of, is that, you know, it's, it's not just like, let's say, call, calling them universal demands. Uh, that I think is a good place to start because that's what unites people, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The people need housing, right? And it's no matter who it is, um, if you're below a certain income line, which is always you know, getting higher and higher, um, you need housing, right? And that was a way to unite all of these kind of broad swaths of people that lived in the downtown east side in Chinatown. Um, and like, I, I talk a bit about, you know, there's this uh, kind of big housing struggle that I was a part of for 58 West Hastings, which was a, going to be a 100% social housing site that was promised by the mayor, we actually got him to sign a piece of paper, Ray Robertson, uh, back in the day, saying that he would build it. He never did. Um, but the, the exciting part was that when we came together after that initial win, we were so excited and we would have like, you know, indigenous folks, drug users, the unhoused folks, Chinatown uh, folks all together at the same table. And the way that we started to imagine this kind of universal housing for all of us started to actually be inflected by the particularity of people's, let's say, cultural background. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we were thinking about even laying out the blueprints, right, of this, you know, dream social housing, you know, the Chinatown seniors are like, oh, on our floor, we want communal kitchens. And then, you know, in the indigenous families that wanted, you know, that wanted this to be a site of unification of indigenous families, they're like, oh, we want like long rooms, right? The kind of like the long house. Um, and like, these are ways in which I think this is the kind of dialectical process of how universal demands start to be inflected and shaped and transformed and advanced by the particularity of people's desires and needs. Um, and I think that that's the process of like, you know, pushing forward and thinking about uh, your question about what happens after you decenter whiteness, um, I think is that's it's never ending, right? It's a never ending mm -hmm. process as we build these kind of wild combinations by being with the people, as Alpha would say, uh, we start to actually the, it explodes the imagination as mm -hmm. as uh, Membe would would talk about, uh, and start to create possibilities that we didn't even fucking we couldn't even imagine before. <laughs> 
right? Uh, in the kind of combinations and and like the power of actually coming together, you know, on about something universal, that's when the particular starts to also kind of emerge and shape and transform uh, our desire into a collective one. Um, anyways, but that, that would be my last statement uh, on, on this. That's a pretty tight last statement. And, and I mean, bearing in mind our time, I wish we could carry on. We've got a hell of a lot more material. Uh, Alfred, do you have a last statement there, brother? I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm just really, I, I love what Vince has been talking about. And uh, I like, you know, whenever people come to a table is when you see great things happen. Right. And, and I think that your presentation and your, your paper is calling people to a table, not to speak away from a table. And I think that's fantastic. And, and uh, it's in line with what we're doing. You know, when, when the different people sit at the table, I say you almost hear a different rhythm instead of just one song being played. Being African, we go back to the land of the drum. You know, you want to hear different sounds. Everybody must show up to play the drum. And then you have community. Then you have joy. And then you have growth. I think that's like, there's so much to pull from what you're saying. And uh, I'm just really glad to sit, at, sit here and listen, really. That's all I got to say. Thank you again, guys. George, do you any thoughts? You yeah, can, um, yeah, reflective counselor. Great. I just love how we've touched on and spoke about how complex this all is, and it's not everything fitting into a nice little box. And we have this magic solution, this magic pill. It's so complex. And Alpha, over the years, you've just been so enlightening, helping. Um, articulate all this and vincent i know we events we only just met but you too thank you um there's just so much to it and and it, all i can say is thank you it, it's been great and i i want to continue these discussions obviously we don't have time right now we have a little bit more to cover and we have to respect everybody's time to go home to their families but Wow. Well, well done. And I'll, I'll stop speaking because if anybody else wants to put in their two bits too, I'd love to hear it. Although I completely respect if they just want to listen and learn, that is also 100% cool. But thank you, everybody. It's, it's thus far unbelievable. It's great. Thank you. Thanks, George. Um, yeah, I, really, we've, time is almost up, but there's a few other things I, I have to give a shout out in terms of decentering whiteness. Um, another aspect to it is around Pan-Africanism and Pan-Africanist philosophy and the Black Power Movement. Um, the the uh, role of Pan-Africanism and the, the Black Power Movement is, I don't see it very much as uh, reflected in, in North America and in Vancouver and Canada. Uh, and coming, having been born in South Africa, I think, uh, one of the things that helped me understand myself and uh, was issues around Pan-Africanism. I want to give a shout out there to uh, Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah, the great founders of, of modern Africa, Lipold Senghor, Kenneth Kaunda, Steve Biko, and Robert Subukwe. And then, of course, Nelson Mandela would come into that, that conversation. Um, and if people are looking for another uh, aspect to follow, um, there are some of the writers and, and readers uh, of Pan-Africanism and Pan-Africanist philosophy. Um, and I think Pan-Africanism is, is emerging again as a force in um, modern politics. And certainly, you know, the, the United States is recognizing that recently with a massive um, attempt to, to bring in uh, African leaders right at the moment. So the, the, uh, And there's a whole bunch of additional things which are going on in Africa at the moment. Um, so if people are looking for another aspect of decentering whiteness, maybe um, turn to some of the writings of Kwame Nkrumah and Nepal Segor and uh, certainly Steve Biko and, and uh, Robert Subukwe, founder of the Pan-Africanist Congress in South Africa. Um, you all know Gil Scott Heron's um, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised because that is an essential component of Pan-Africanist philosophy. The revolution has to occur in our minds um, and it won't be able to be televised. We won't be able to capture it on film because you can't capture the revolution going on in your mind, in our minds. And, and that phrase, the revolution will not be, and that notion uh, also goes back to um, you know, some of our readings uh, and some of the philosophers and thinkers which we were looking at in our first session. Um, and some of the that um, Achille and Bembi draw on 
um, and thinkers like Franz Fanon, that is an important part of of Paulo Fre of um, um, Akil Mbembe's thought. So I'll just throw that out quickly. Um, and then um, Centering Whiteness, the Colonial Education Projects, um, three key parts of the antithesis of decentering whiteness is centering whiteness again. Um, and if we want to reflect on that in terms of education and us as teachers and, and educators in the formal school system, the colonial education projects, which we're still a part of, was a fundamental aspect of centering whiteness. Uh, and residential schools, I think, fit within the model um, of, of colonial projects, removing people, uh, removing indigenous um, and, um, people from the land um, and struck putting them into what we called in South Africa Bantu education, what they called here in Canada residential schools. Um, what Yongo, the Kenyan writer, speaks about it as well in his experience. And then de-skill and reskill, de-skill indigenous societies, um, and then reskill them. And what was in South Africa's parliament, our Minister of Education said, turn black people into hewers of wood and drawers of water. Um, and that they had no other role, indigenous um, African people had no other role in South Africa's economy. Uh, and similarly, the same piece was occurring exactly here in our residential schools um, and in uh, the various education systems here in Canada that we are still part of, um, but which is part of our legacy and what we're trying to address when we come to talking about um, reconciliation. And then finally, denying people access not only to land, but education as well, through reserves and through homelands, through the Musqueam land down the bottom here, where all of this land that McGee is on um, was grabbed by Farmer McGee a um, hundred odd years ago. And uh, he owned, he took the land uh, from here down to the Fraser River and from here at in Kerisdale all the way down to um, UBC. And so that aspect of denying access to land was one single Mr. McGee grabbing it all from the colonial government uh, and forcing Musqueam people off this land. And we know about that. We are aware of that. And we're part of this process is to decenter that colonial education project. Um, another part of, of the decentering whiteness now are the anti-colonial um, or post-colonial education projects. You've got self-reliance, which Steve Biko was speaking about, uh, and various projects around that. You've got linguistic revival, Paulo Freire, if people want to look at that, a beautiful collection, the letters to Guinea-Bissau is interesting that we read in South Africa during the liberation struggle. And then um, the role of reggae and music, dub, and Jill Scott Heron, we've already mentioned, back in the 70s, um, and we want to bring it into the European context, uh, Linton Kwesi Johnson in the UK, uh, a remarkable album that he put out. Um, so I want to also not lose sight of the role of popular culture in framing struggle and reviving it and bringing it about, um, the role of reggae, rap, dab, um, and the foundations of, of some of, of people like Linton Kwesi Johnson here in the, North, in the European context. And that would bring us to our next slide. Um, which would be uh, Sonny's Letter. If people are interested, um, look up Linton Kwesi Johnson. Sonny's Letter is a beautiful poem about an incarcerated uh, young person who is writing to his mum. And uh, it was one of the early pieces of, of um, dab in the British context. We won't play it now and because I think we're really out of time. But I just want to throw it out um, for people who feel like some inspiration and something different from a cultural kind of a framework. Andrew, I can um, put it in the discussion there so people have a direct link to it. Oh, fantastic. Um, and I think we're really out of time and we, uh, are, we do want to be mindful of, of people's time. Um, so we want to thank you guys for making it out tonight um, and being part of this conversation. Um, and however many of us there are, it's better than nobody. And um, so thank you so much, Vince. Thank you so much, Alpha, um, George, of course, um, and Kelvin for your background work and your support from UBC side. Any concluding comments there, George, Vince, or anyone else out there? Oh, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, and once again, it was great uh, to unpack it all. And I'm sure we could have hours and hours and hours of more discussion on it. And I'm looking forward to discussing this more in the future with some of you. Yeah, thanks Thank you so, so much. I uh, hope to meet you guys in person someday in the future. <laughs> Over a beer, Vince. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Alpha. Thank you, brother. See you guys. Bye, guys. Good night.
Cheers. Thanks so much, Kelvin. No problem. Have a good day.